Welcome back to Amazing But True, our New York Mets podcast from the New York Post. Jake Brown here alongside Nelson Figueroa, who you hear the advertisements for, where Figgy, uh, you know, Gary Cohen, who will enter the Mets Hall of Fame on Saturday at City Field, said, uh, you know, Emmy Award winning analyst Nelson Figueroa with Mark Malusis. And that led to them talking about Keith Emmys. (laughs) And apparently he hadn't got one in a while. So well, was... he beat me. He beat me out for one. That's what happened. Oh, did he? Okay. Yeah. There was like a long pause. I don't know if they were thinking about it and what happened, but um, there's been a lot of pauses watching the Mets bullpen <laughs> this weekend too. Uh, this is a catastrophe. Happy Memorial Day weekend, everybody. Hope By you way. all are having a uh, nice barbecues today and Monday. If if you're listening to this and having a few be- beers and wiping your Mets sorrows away, luckily the Mets off today, Monday Memorial Day. So. Thank you to all those who have served for our country. And uh, you're a rock in the, the Memorial Day themed hat. I believe that was the one they wore mm-hmm. last year. It's criminal that there's no baseball Memorial Day for the Mets. But we are glad because it saves our mental health, Figgy. The Mets lose two out of three. They go two and four this week against two bad teams. The Colorado mile high air did not help the Mets pitching. It helped the bats. You know, they scored enough. They score seven on Saturday. They score 10 on Sunday. And normally that's enough. It wasn't. It wasn't because you put Steven Nagasuk into the game. And I don't know why Buck Showalter has trust in this guy. He's not good. You look at the his appearances over the course of the season, and there's a reason why, you know, Nagasuk, or as Frank the Tank will say, no good suck, uh, is his name. Uh, his ERA is now 6.33. He should not be trusted in big spots. He implodes and gives up five runs on Sunday. And that was the game, Figgy. You know, every time the Mets come back, they get it going. They rally. Uh, he is there to blow it. And they get Francisco Alvarez swinging homers left and right, five in his last eight games. But the bullpen, any sign of resiliency this team has, the bullpen wipes it away. Another frustrating series loss in Colorado. Yeah, but we've known this for quite some time, right? The bullpen is going to be the weakness uh, for this Mets team when you don't have your shutdown closer and, you know, you're counting on uh, Robertson to be uh, perfect. That's We notice he's not perfect now. You know, he has been giving up runs as well. Adovino has had some bad moments, but it, it really these other guys um, – I told you when we started seeing them, they were doing well when it wasn't big situations, right? When the team takes the lead, you need a shutdown inning. And to go out there and give up a six-piece right after you just took the lead, that's inexcusable. You've got to find a way to be more competitive than that, um, move the ball around, do something a little bit different. Colorado is not the place that you want to say, ah, you know what, I can get more of the plate. No, you got to try and – you use pitches that can cross the zone, up in the zone. You have to change eye levels. There's a lot of things you have to do to have success in Colorado um, because every mistake has a potential of leaving the ballpark. Um, he saw that the hard way, two of them in that one inning. And that's well, something that it can't continue to keep happening. Every time he goes out there, you don't know which guy you're going to get. He's gotten some trust from Buck because, frankly, who else – is he going to do is can't keep using the same guys over and over again. You know, Brigham, I said the same thing about Brigham and, you know, you can see the same kind of things for him where it's starting to wear on them. This bullpen's already looking extremely tired and we're not even done with may. Um, that's really uh, the biggest issue that we've had with this Mets team. And for all the gruff that we gave about the offense, this offense continues to scratch and claw and fight back in these games and get put you in a position even to win games, but the bullpen has to be better all the way around. You can't lose a game where Tommy Pham has three hits, four RBIs, and two stolen bases to save his spot on the roster. You can't do it, and that's what happened. And Nagasuk sucked. But also Tyler McGill sucked. And, Wait, you, you know, can't, you can't, you're killing me because you're saying the, the, the no good suck. So when I first went to Chicago and I'm walking to the stadium, I'm going to start and they have like all these jerseys hanging up outside the stadium. Uh, Fukudomi was hanging up outside there and I phonetically read that one and I was like, oh my God, they're selling that on the back of a jersey? Think about what that says. Yeah, well, both of them don't mean good things, and uh, you know, both aren't great players. I guess he might he was better than Steven Nagasuk. Uh, I mean, any other occupation, you're fired. 
He's given up runs in eight of 11 appearances. Why does Buck keep going? Him? Yeah, yes, I get look, it. The rest of the bullpen down. isn't great, but he shouldn't be on the roster. And maybe that's a Billy Upper problem. This bullpen is a Billy Upper problem. It's something I tweeted today. You see how much this team misses Trevor Williams. And I get the argument. Trevor Williams wanted to be a starter. Seth Lugo wanted to be a starter. They left to be a starter. I 100% get that. But something to me tells me if the Mets were to pay both those guys, to be relievers and maybe give them more money than they got, and you use Uncle Stevie's multi millions and multi billions, maybe they come back. I can't guarantee it. Maybe they wanted to start, but maybe if you had offered six million, you know, to Trevor Williams, it would have been an overpay, maybe. But look, he's been solid, and that's a guy who was a perfect bridge guy, Figgy, a role that you had in your career. A mm -hmm. starter implodes, Verlander sucked, and you put in a Trevor Williams, and he would give you three innings and keep the game either tight or keep it from becoming more of a blowout, and that's right. kind of what the Mets needed. You know, they were able to score the runs. The bullpen just imploded, and, you know, Dominic Leone, uh, you know, we joke about the Billy Joel song, was solid over the weekend. He was good. But then Brigham was bad. So it's like you get a good thing from him. You get a good spot from Hunter, but you get bad from Nagasak and McGill. Let's talk about this, the starting mm -hmm. pitching. Tyler McGill is going to likely be the guy until Jose Quintana is ready, which might not be for another month. And that's going to be a problem here. You know, four earned, but he gives up six runs. Same thing last start. Four earned, six runs. Are you What happened to Tyler McGill? Was it the Colorado Air and, you know, can you survive with him as the fifth starter until Quintana comes back? Well, it's not just been the Colorado thing. The start right before that as well, there's a ton of hits that are happening against him. He's not having that wipeout, strikeout type stuff that we're used to seeing from him, like the high velocity up in the zone and moving the ball around. He's leaving too many pitches to be hittable, and they're getting hit hard. I mean, this isn't just, you know, talking about bloopers. You know, they're making errors where he's got some unearned runs on his tab, but he's got to find a way with two outs. This all happened with two outs today that's the thing that drives you crazy that's the thing that you're like man if a guy miss hits the ball and that's what i'm talking about you have to miss hit the ball just a little bit and it's an out they were not miss hitting any of those balls he he walked uh bryant that was a huge walk right there where those are the kind those guys and the tovars you saw tovar got handled all weekend with throwing him breaking balls out of the strike zone he's swinging at everything and they continue to make mistakes over the middle of the plate to him. He crushed another one today, you know, off the wall, um, another triple. That that's that team. I said um, was doing WPIX, and I said that this team doesn't hit a lot of home runs, but they have a lot of doubles, a lot of triples because of the way that the ballpark plays. And they're not hitting a ton of home runs, but they're hitting balls in the gaps. They're hitting balls in you know down the line, and they're legging it out. So they lead. And so many triples that Pete Alonso even Pete Alonso even hit a triple. How about that? And, and you looked up, and Pete was already at third base. Didn't that surprise you? Like, holy oh, cow! Yeah. When when did Pete get that fast? I was like, well, who are they trying to throw out at third? I'm like, my Pete is already there. That's incredible. So yeah, that ballpark is built. It's so ex it's so expansive in the outfield that the gaps are huge. So you have to overship. So that what's what happened with Marte? Marte couldn't get to that ball. Um, and, yeah, and let's talk about that for a second, because that was the talk of Twitter today. People saying Nimmo there, that doesn't happen. That changes the whole game. There's two arguments here. One, that's a, still a tough play, no matter who's in center. He had to go for a long run. But the other argument is, one, you have an off day Monday. Why is Marte for the, starting in center field for the first time in two years in arguably the toughest ballpark to play center field? Because like you say, the gaps going gap to gap. Why is that happening when you have an off day tomorrow? Why not do that either at City Field this week or choose another day when there's an off day? I get you get the two days in a row now for Nimmo, but this seemed like the wrong time to not have your best defensive center fielder. I remember last year we argued, we were like, oh, do we, you know, I like Marte in center field. Was this the right move? It ended up being the right decision to move him right. What do you think of that, you know, addressing, do you think Nimmo, that was the wrong move by Buck or just a tough play for Marte there. Yeah, I mean, just a tough play for Marte. You know, it's hard to second guess, Buck, because, again, this team is only a half game out of the wild card with all the disastrous things that we've said, right? You're ready to burn it down every other week with this team. They they give you a little bit of joy, and then they bring you right back crashing down to earth. And I, I think you, you have to realize, with all that being said, you're a half game out. You know the deficiencies of this team. You have to get guys some rest. Guys are not going to play 160 of 162 like they normally did, um, you know, back in my day. So these things are scheduled in advance as well. Like I'm telling you that it's not like, Oh my God, he had four hits yesterday. So let's rest him. 
no, it, it's already booked for him to have that rest. And usually some guys can try and fight it and argue it, but they don't want to argue against the manager and what the plan is because they understand that somebody's putting this plan together. Okay, well, you're going to be out of the lineup for the next game, you know, and you would hope that the team can survive without you being in the lineup. Is there only one person, one game? But it seems like it's such a house of cards, right? And that you have that nimbo that you're counting on to be at the top of the lineup, to get on base, to drive in runs, and play really solid defense as he did, has done all year long. You said it best. Still a very difficult play. Doesn't mean that he comes up with it. But there's always you know, hindsight. You can second guess it if you want. But I still think that pitches have to be made. Uh, those rallies cannot be six runs in an inning. It, it's just, it, it's unthinkable to give up that many hits and runs in just one single inning. And it happened back to back nights. And um, it wasn't like that ball was like, you know, the easiest play. I thought like, I, I see the side of, yes, if Nimmo's in there, he a hundred percent catches that, but I didn't get that mad. Cause it wasn't like, it was like the Tommy fam drop fly ball in Chicago. It wasn't right. like that kind of right. Drop, but guess what? It cost them three. It was three runs. It cleared the bases. It changed the game, and the Mets end up losing by one run. So, mate, that is the play. But that's what happens when your starter is just that ineffective and giving up ten hits. You can't give up, like you said, all these hits. And it's just the what's the? It's the uh, the tunnel, the bridge, and it just falls down. The ladder, the ladder. Maybe it's the ladder. It's the ladder effect. It was a lo- long weekend, long Saturday night. Um, but it was the latter effect. They hit the next reliever, hit the next reliever. And you're seeing, you know, and Billy Epler deserves a lot of criticism here. You know, I know that Edwin Diaz injury sucked. You went out and got Robertson and you went at rally, but what else did you do? You put a ton of faith in Drew Smith who gives up, of course, at Homer. And no matter what Drew Smith stats are, I just can't trust him. I don't know. We've I don't said, know. Well, I, you know me. I've said this for like three, four years now that, yeah, it's nice. He has a 1.88, but look inside the numbers. Look at when he does it. And every time that they put him in big situations, he doesn't come through. And it's frustrating because he has plus stuff. And it's after he gives up the bomb, after he gives up the lead, that all of a sudden, oh, look at that. I struck out the side and I'm unhittable. I, I He's got to have that like mentality of, of I, I'm I'm getting these three guys one two three no chance they have to fear me kind of thing and he doesn't do that he doesn't but remember do that Buck vibe. Buck put him in that class of Adovino and Robertson and that's but what's concerning that, about the trying roster to do that but you have to do that with the players you have to mm-hmm. pump them up in that way and make him think oh wow he considers me that level and I, I get that at that level but that's I bad thing at that level like that's bad I'm backing it up that, it, it's just bad that this team puts him in that class because he's not and that's why. You know, I, and I continue to say every week the middle really sucked, but they, you know, they made some poor moves. The Williams letting go, Lugo letting go, and then you know a minor move that I read today. As you catch up on guys, you know, to make room for Tommy Pham, they got rid of T- Taylor Saucedo. Saucedo, I don't know how to pronounce it. Saucedo. Lefty, he has a .82 ERA in eleven innings for the Mariners this year. So that's another potential reliever that you let go. That's gone. Bryce Montes de Oca, who you know throws a hundred, you're expecting yep. him to be big out for the year. So I get that they were hit with some injuries, but this bullpen can't survive like this. And, no. and there's not going to be trades to be made for a while, Figgy. Mm-hmm. And you're going to have to find guys like Leon on the scrap heap. And I just don't know who else is out there. Cause when I look at Syracuse, the only guys are see, I see Walker who was just up and they brought back down muck and Hearn, who was here and didn't look great. And guys like Yacobonis and Uceda, who got hurt, who was on this team. There aren't many guys in AAA doing much. Dennis Santana, who we saw here, wasn't good. They don't have much in the farm system. Nathan Lavender. I love a good Lavender set. La- Lavender is the one that the, that is really tricking all of baseball. He's like a 91, 92-mile-an-hour fastball, and he just struck out two of the biggest prospects on, like, you know, all fastballs. Just Give him a call up. So and they and they will do that eventually because the the kid er, uh, has earned it and you're going to see one of these other guys go down or go on the IL whatever it may be but I think what happened was that the original plan was Scherz is going to give you 7 and then you're only going to have to use one of these two relievers that you're counting on or one of them to finish out the game. Verland is going to give you seven and you only use one reliever with him. So that really rests the bullpen, those two starts. And then you get it to the other guys. And hopefully, you know, they set the tone that six is what they want as acceptable. You're looking at this starting rotation. I want to say that they're averaging like four and a third. 
innings pitch. Like they're not even averaging five innings a game right now. The bullpen is really taxed already and it's not going to get any better anytime soon. And if you're looking for help and then you're looking on the scrap heap, then you're not going to find, you, you hope to find a gem. You hope to find somebody who, you know, wants to relocate somewhere and, and get another chance. But I don't think that there's, there, there's anything that they can do. Yes, the injuries hit them hard, but uh, the the disappointing performances that you know you, you shouldn't have Verlander through his last three starts having a six and a half ERA, um, but he wants to eat up innings. But it doesn't help you if he's giving up runs while eating up those innings. Um, Let's talk about him. What what did you see Saturday? Six runs. I, he got rocked. The Mets came back again. Both pin blows. What went wrong with Verlander? Yeah, I, you know what? I think just, you know, missing location and these guys, these Rockies are aggressive. They're very aggressive when they're swinging. It was funny because I was watching him watching Scherzer. When Scherzer was pitching, he had like the little sheet in his hand and he's looking over the hitters and he's formulating his game plan. And you're watching Scherzer pitch and you know what his bread and butter is, right? He's, he's got the High fastballs that he throws mixed in with the changeup in any count, and then the wipeout slider, which is a little bit slower than most. Like he's okay with throwing a slider in the mid 80s and not 92 miles an hour. So for Verlander, I kind of thought he would be formulating kind of the same game plan to execute and, and attack hitters' weaknesses. And he did that, you know, the first inning, and then all of a sudden, it was only the third inning when all of a sudden the wheels fell off. Uh, he got hit with another comebacker. Um, it's like the sixth or seventh time he's been hit in, in the lower extremities on the year. And uh, it, it really just kind of rattled him a little bit, and he couldn't get back on track. He's he's going to be better. I, I have no doubt in that. Um, I've seen him adjust his pitches um, from start to start where you're going to see the usage of curveballs or sliders. One of them is going to have, you know, a higher usage percentage. Uh, and it just comes down to executing and locating with his fastball. But if he's constantly behind in the count and you're in a place like, you know, Colorado, like I said, the biggest thing is home runs are home runs. They're, they're, bad pitches leave the ballpark, but it's the balls that go gap to gap when you're shifting over and you have to execute pitches. So if you have everybody shifting towards left field and you throw a guy a pitch who's a righty on the outside part of the plane, he pokes it to right. They're not defending that. So he did a great job when he came back last year with the uh, Astros of pitching to the game plan, pitching to the defense, and they still had the shift last year, right? So you had an extra guy on that side of the field. Well, he didn't miss his locations a lot last year, and it was something that we looked at on MLB Network. We went into, and they were like, you know, he's not getting the uh, swings and misses that he normally gets with his stuff. What is it about him? I said, he's a veteran guy who realizes he doesn't have to go for the punch outs. If he can get a two pitch out, that's better than a three pitch strikeout because it saves him a pitch and he can continue going deeper into games. And that's what he did really well that Cy Young year. Right now, I think he has to get back to that. He just seems to me like he's trying to overdo it to get more swings and misses and to try and uh, help himself out rather than you know relying on this defense and executing pitches. And it's frustrating because Friday you get Scherzer, you know, the most strikeouts he had all year in eight, giving up a run. He was yeah. great. Mm -hmm. And then Saturday you get followed up Verland implosion, McGill implosion. And now you get the Phillies coming to town who are wildly inconsistent as well. I mean, this division is inconsistent. The Mets are now in third place. They are five and a half back. The Marlins in second. So the Mets are half game out of the third wild card spot. And you're in a tough boat here because the schedule, like we said, only will get tougher. Listen, the Phillies are one of those teams floating around 500, around three games under right now. Mm -hmm. And then you got the Blue Jays coming to town and the road will get difficult, Figgy, for the Mets who have that gauntlet in June. Three Phillies, three Blue Jays, three against the first place Braves, three against the Pirates, two Yankees, three Cardinals, three Astros, three Phillies, four Brewers, and then heading into July, three Giants. So it is difficult. And then mm -hmm. Diamondbacks, Padres, and uh, then the Dodgers. After, so it's just nonstop good teams. Yep. Like Diamondbacks have been good. Brewers are good. Phillies are have a good offense. The pitching's not great. Like just yep. nonstop good teams. And maybe they'll play up to that level of competition, mm -hmm. but they won't with this bullpen. And something's got to change. We'll see what happens this week. Does Mauricio get a call up? Do like we say, does McFarland was that his name? McFarland, yeah. uh, get the call up. Not that that makes a world. Of, does Walker come back? That's the traditional mic, the microphone falling, just like the Mets bullpen here. Um, <laughs> does does uh Walker come back here? And they'll face Taiwan Walker, by the way, on Thursday this week, uh, Thursday afternoon. So something's got to give. I just don't know what you could do. I just well, don't know, Figgy. You you said it great, like Tommy Pham hit 
today like he was hitting for his job and he he is right but the idea i thought he was getting cut monday if he didn't have a big day i really thought mauricio was coming up for tuesday's game the i well the idea is i think mauricio is still coming up but what do you have to do if you're running from a bear you don't have to beat the bear you have to beat the guy next to you right that's what he did with uh vogelback vogelback gonna be the guy i was gonna say is the bear vogelback he is a big fella he's the the bear in this case the bear the bear and the guy you have to beat of both vogelback so uh, i think tommy fam did that today because uh, again mauricio is a left-handed hitter um can play multiple infield positions also can steal you a bag he's athletic he i think he has nine or ten stolen bases down in the minor leagues so you need that guy to be able to come off the bench and pinch run so you're not counting on escobar at 35 36 years young to steal you bags in big games and big moments so i think the writing's on the wall for vogel back um they, they, they didn't pay much for him so they gave him every opportunity to lose this job and he i feel he has done it i think every time he comes up now it's just you know, it's a non-competitive at bat, uh, right in the middle of a lineup that you know really needs that somebody in the middle to to get it to the next guy, get it to the uh, a guy who can you know come through with a big hit. And Francisco Alvarez's jump from the nine spot to the two hole is something that you know is writing on the wall. This is what finally the, right. Finally, I, yeah, we've been no. waiting for him to go up to seven. I don't think he'll stay at two. McNeil was no, off no, Sunday, no. but he's, not, he's got to at least go to six or seven. He's just tearing the cover off the ball. Yeah, he's he's been really impressive in the fact that we said in the beginning of the season he just looked like he still was jittery. He was overmatched. He was jumping at pitches and and didn't seem like he even had a plan or an approach. That's something that a ball kids do, and that's why they're so dangerous because you never know what this kid is thinking with, with Alvarez now it looks like he goes up there with a plan and uh he, his and he's clutch got, clutch hits clutch his homers. Got, yeah his swings has got have gotten better and better they're in big moments uh you know to tie games or or to, to you know get the lead uh that's that's a huge factor and I think he's finally becoming that guy that Buck wasn't ready and I love this about Buck Buck wasn't ready to just hand over the mantle to him and said he wasn't ready. He hasn't proven anything. I know you guys think he's a, a talented prospect and, you know, number one, one of the number one prospects in all of baseball, but he hasn't done anything to earn the right to have that playing time. And it happened because of injury, right? Nito gets hurt and you have to put uh, Alvarez out there and he's learning on the fly, but everybody seems like they're much more comfortable with Alvarez behind the dish and his batting is is improved tremendously in the month of may it makes me even more excited about him for the month of Zo- month of june yeah and, and that's the thing like there are positive things we're not saying yep. the sky is falling yet because we're seeing things like that you know from a generational catcher who's looking like the best hitting catcher in the league people are tweeting that it's not even like that false the way he is playing five homers eight games confidence clutch hits swagger i mean every time he homers he's jumping a first he throws the bat And you can't be mad at it the way he is playing right now. And, you know, this week, and it's Lavender is the one I was talking about, will be the replacement. And Nate Lavender, who's been great, and a second lefty reliever that the Mets are so badly craving behind. Rarely, maybe he's the guy. But Naga sucks. Got to get DFA'd before Tuesday. So maybe, you know, this is the the two minor moves, and we see this week. You call up Nate Lavender, you get rid of Naga suck. You call up Mauricio. And I guess Fam is the guy. Fam would be then the guy. And then when Narvaez, who has begun rehab, he you would think he replaces Nita. That brings an interesting situation of that can will. the Mets have Narvaez catch some games with Alvarez being your DH? I don't think anyone will lose sleep about that. The only problem is do you want two catchers in the game, not having another one on the bench? Maybe they keep three. I don't think I really don't think it's worth keeping Nito, to be honest, if you have both those guys. But that is another option you have if you do decide to cut Vogel back, which I think needs to come. At least Bam gives you that outfielder and an occasional pinch runner. Yep. Vogelback doesn't even get like Vogelback doesn't even ever play first. He's just a DH. So you, he is legit a waste of a roster spot if he's not going to hit for power, which he has not done. So I think those are the moves. You would hope going into the six game homestand that happened. Lavender up, Nagasak gone, uh, Vogelback gone, and Mauricio up. You know, Jolly Olive on the last episode with me brought up the good point of, you know, maybe they're just keeping him in AAA to keep his trade value at an all time high figgy. Maybe they're worried he's going to come up here and not be good. His value goes down. And then what, what reliever or power bat will you go out and get 
if his value plummets because he goes, you know, oh for seventeen to start his big league career. Well, you, you know, I, I think in this day and age, um, you look past that initial uh, test, right? You 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 have to. You you look at the body of work of what he's done in his career. You look at the improvements that he's made along the way. His jump from you know the double A player to the triple A player that he is now, including the winter ball where he was. MVP for with Lise in the Dominican Winter League. You know, this kid looks like he's finally turned the corner. He was a scrawny little kid when he first came up, and uh, Rosario was the the starting shortstop for the Mets. And it was like, we, there's three other guys. There's Jimenez, there's Mauricio, there's, uh, and there was another guy. I can't remember if they traded him or not. But there was these two guys that – they're also really good. And then they went out and get Lindor and you're like, well, where does that, where does that fit now? Where, where's everybody go? So Mauricio has been playing second base. It hasn't gone as planned. He's made a ton of errors at second base already in 24. I think it's 24 games that he's played second. He's made like six or seven errors. So it hasn't gone as smoothly as one would hope, but at the same time, it's the offensive side of the ball. It's using him as a left-handed DH um, and and finding ways to make this whole thing work. That three-headed catcher thing is going to be a problem because you're paying uh, Nevarez, uh, uh for two years, um, or well, one in a, uh, a mutual or player, I think it's a player option even. Um, but it's a two year deal that he got, uh, Nito, same thing. You paid him to stay around. So you can't just pay guys to just sit around and not be activated or not be playing. So uh, uh, there's no way that they could send down Alvarez. Uh, uh, there's no way he's played his way into this thing uh, full time, but you know, there's going to have to be something that gets done. So whether Nito gets included in the trade package, cause the one person that you talked about, whose trade value has gone down because he's being exposed at the big league level, Mark Vientos. He had 13 home runs when he came up with 35 RBIs or whatever it was. He does not look like that hitter in the big leagues. He's hit some good singles, <laughs> but we've seen the one home run in his very first game. And, you know, that gave you, okay, maybe this guy has finally figured it out. You know, uh, not even comparable, but Aaron Judge's first year in the big leagues batted like 164 or something like that. And would you say, oh, my God, this guy stinks. He's six foot seven and with this huge swing. And he worked in the offseason and got better. And then he's been Aaron Judge ever since. So for Vientos, you thought that he kind of figured that out. But we still haven't seen that translate to big league at bat. So yeah, he had a heard... couple at Saturday, but he needs to be consistent, too. You got to keep putting him out there. That. He'll get his third straight game on Tuesday. He's got to get like if Vogelback's not going to give you hits. Why not have Vientos not give you hits so you could see something out of him? So three straight starts is, you know, you know, he played third Sunday, but he'll probably be DH on Tuesday against Suarez mm -hmm. against the Phillies at City Field. He needs that consistency like Alvarez has gotten to develop that bat. You're not wrong. He's he sucked, but I think some consistency here will help him improve. Yeah, uh, undoubtedly, undoubtedly, he's got to get over that hump of, uh, again, Alvarez looked really jumpy in the beginning of the season. We kept saying it, man, every time this guy takes a swing, it's like he's he's guessing. He doesn't know what's coming. It'll slow down for Vientos because right now it looks like it's slowed down big time for Alvarez. He's seeing balls a, a lot better. He's having better swings, better approach. Um, and, and every player goes through this. So I hope it does. But again, so now if you're having to package something where these three catchers are going to be uh, an issue, you're going have to uh catcher you got uh, a catcher you got vientos uh and you're looking for something in return in the middle relief you know back end uh reliever type area that's going to help complete your team as of right now because you can't depend on only the three guys you know really uh Adovino and robertson to get the job done every time and the issue is with the parity in the national league everybody is in it right now mm -hmm. like oh, legit no. everyone including yeah. The Washington Nationals who are last place, who including the Cubs who are in last place, who are just five and a half out of first in last place, including the Rockies who just beat the Mets, who are 24 and 30 and just a couple games out of the wild card. So because everyone's in it, no one's looking really to trade right now. Yep. That hurts the Mets. And I don't know. I mean, there's nothing you could do about, you know, teams, <laughs> the parity being good. There's no A's in the National League. There's no Royals <laughs> in the National League. The A's who are 10 and 45, the Royals who are 16 and 38. Can you make a trade with one of those guys? I just don't know if they have anyone good that you would want. Well, I, I tell you right now, the way that Chapman has been throwing the ball the first two months of the season, Chapman would be a huge get. 
uh, left left hander. And do you want Chapman and the distraction that he causes and the off the field stuff? Do you want? Have you that heard anything? Have right? you heard anything about Chapman since he's been in Kansas City? No, because it's Kansas City, right? All exactly. You come back to oh. New York, but he's been here happens? in New York. He's been here in New York, and everybody talked about all that before. So I'm not worried about him. I I know he can. I know he can pitch in New York. I know he can handle the media in New York, and it's it's something that he's done his whole career. So I wouldn't mind it at all. But it, that's a huge ace that. Is uh, you know the wild card that they're waving around for everybody to see who's going to be the highest bidder. You, like you just said, if you go through the teams that are in the wild card race right now, and I know we're a long way away from it being important numbers, but you got Mets and Pittsburgh a half game out, Philadelphia one and a half, Cincinnati three, San Diego three. As bad as they're playing, San Diego at three games out, Colorado at three and a half, St. Louis at four. As bad as they're playing, uh, the the Nationals are at four, and the Chicago Cubs are at four and a half out. Those all those teams are still in the hunt. Anything can happen. We talked about uh, off you know before we got on. On camera, you know, we, we were talking with hearts about the run differentials, right? And all those teams that I just mentioned, there's only three to have positive run differentials, meaning that their team scores more runs than they let up. Pittsburgh Pirates at a plus 10, the St. Louis Cardinals at a plus 13, and the Chicago Clubs at a plus four. Everybody else is negative. And when you talk about negative, the uh, Oakland A's, to give you some reference, are at minus 199. OK, they gave up 200 more runs and they've scored. That tells you how bad they are. So you would think I was on the roster for the, that bad. For the Mets. They're at minus 13. So it's not as bad as it seems, but it's been in bunches, right? These runs. If you look at even the games that they had in Colorado, it's been six run innings, not 10 runs throughout the game. You know what I mean? Like that's that's something to me that, yeah, I, I, I don't discredit it because they're runs that scored, but. It's like, okay, we scored this many in the third inning, and then what? We got shut out for the next six. That's the kind of thing that I, I would like to see more of them stretching out these innings and taking these leads and saying, let's build on these, and let's find a way to just score a run an inning after you score six. And then all of a sudden you're up. You know, you got 12 runs in the game because you're scoring one run an inning. Play the game that way instead of looking for that big outburst in another inning somewhere in the game because that usually doesn't happen, especially with the Mets. The Mets head into Memorial Day at 500 at 27 and 27. A rough week on the road. They return home. Have a nice homestand here. Have a nice four and two homestand. And we'll see when we head to when I head to the ballpark Tuesday. I'd love to see Mauricio on the roster. I'd like to see Nagasuk having IHOP in Syracuse, hopefully. Uh, spe- you know, uh, another nugget I had to throw in the show is that Austin Wynn's walk up song is actually Dancing Queen, which. You know, was is tremendous. You know, I, I love one on every team. I think one, there's one guy in every team that has Dancing Queen. And well, I remember when I got to call a few innings of your Fairy Hawk game that Duplantis had Dan- du- Duplantis Queen, Duplantis Dancing Queen. That was his walk up <laughs> song. Um, so good stuff there from wins. And you know, Ryan McMahon, met, new Met killer, is just such like a a Rockies player. Like he, like you hear Ryan McMahon, and my first guess would be like he's on the Rockies, right? Like he just sounds like a guy. <laughs> On the Colorado Rockies, but just new Met killers develop out of nowhere every week, and it frustrates the hell out of me. A, a huge. I'm I'm glad you brought this up because it drove me nuts. Because every time you do a scouting report and you go into the meetings before you know the series, you know CJ Cron was out. He was injured, and and that was their big one of their big bats in the middle of that lineup. So the guy that can't beat you. This is literally how we would talk every series. The guy that can't beat us is this guy is this guy. And you look at that lineup, and when you look at that lineup, there's one guy, McMahon. Don't let him beat you. And he didn't just beat you. He beat you senseless. He beat you over and over again. He continued to beat you well into his last at bat. This is the kind of thing that you can't have happen against a team like this where there's other guys who have big holes in their swings. They're swinging and missing. Their strikeout numbers are very high. Go attack those guys. Move on from McMahon. I'm not saying walk him. I'm saying pitchers pitches at all times. Nasty stuff with breaking. Make him chase. But you can't make mistakes over the middle of the plate like we saw today or that fastball down and away that he hit the two-run home run off Nagasak. Well, uh, you know, opposite field. Even you're saying Naga suck now. You've adopted it. It, 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 it. It's the writing's on the wall, man. I, I see it as I call it. And I think that's one of the things is that you have to be better at executing a game plan when the Rockies are, uh, are your foe. McMahon is the only guy in that lineup that you have to worry about not letting beat you, and they let him beat him time and time again.
McMahon was the man. Well, the Phillies come to City Field this weekend. It's the first Mets Phillies matchup of the season. You know, pretty wild that this series, end of May, beginning of June, is the first time with this new scheduling. I don't know. Not a big fan of that. I think you got to play division teams more, and they're cutting it back. I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to be that old man on the lawn complain about that that much, but a big week for the Mets. You know, you got to beat your division foes. So this is important. Tuesday, San- Suarez, Sanga, we think for now, you know, I want to touch on that for a second too. Wednesday, Nola, Carrasco, and uh, Thursday will be a 1 p.m. game. I have a flight that night. So I'll hopefully get a, a quickie, quick episode in. Whoa. Before- Whoa. Yeah, a quick. <laughs> quick, quickster uh before i head to uh charlotte for a myrtle beach wedding over the oh, weekend man. and then i'll be in miami the weekend after so uh I'll, if i'm not brought, Baller, dude if i'm not brought, is that private is that a private jet no literally it was a debating flying spirit that's how unprivate it was <laughs> that uh i was advised never to do spirits too small seats you uh, might die you might not make it to the wedding and that that was a factor because what if it's canceled and I'm, i missed the wedding and i'm like i get to myrtle beach sunday it's like yeah we actually got married yesterday you're a little bit late <laughs> i would look like the worst friend ever so um, your pj when you say pj you don't mean private jet it's a public jet <laughs> literally wearing pajamas to the airport is the pj uh but my goal this year is to be on a private private jet at some point uh it's funny today you mentioned that because i think i got butt dialed by my buddy who works for a private jet company so mm. maybe that was a sign like he's maybe like we're, we're getting to the pj you want to get on with us <laughs> bro i can't hear you it's like the backstreet boys the call the song where yeah. the service is low oh god anyways yeah big series this week against the phillies and then the blue jays come to town and gary Cohen, hall of fame uh week he'll be on the show we got to get him on at some point you know he's a busy man so it's tough to make it happen but we will hopefully have Gary. We'll we'll That's exciting. Gary Cohen, Howie Rose going in together in the Mets Hall of Fame, along with Al Leiter and Howard Johnson. So good to, you know, friends of the program, Leiter, Johnson, Rose, not Gary yet. We hope to make him a friend of the program, but we've had all those guys on and great to see them. And I'm pissed I'm missing that. I'm pissed I'm missing the Pete Alonzo neon sunglass giveaway on Sunday. It's a lot better than this stupid little thing that has scarred the Mets. I know I know you're already I know you already talked to somebody there to, to grab you a pair. Uh I, I will have to. I will need to I haven't asked yet. I haven't thought about it till I saw the commercial today where they're like me or Gary said neon sun. I'm like damn I need someone to get me those. So and I, I have I've been either busy or lazy. I have not done the seed growing yet of the uh Lindor Dude, come guys. on you're pushing us back well here's the thing i get i realize i gotta get soil like i gotta go outside no, and dig you dirt don't i don't have gotta, to get soil said you need soil you need to see you need to plant dirt where am i gonna get dirt where am i just going to the street and just get a scooper you know get what? dirt and you're going like away this, this 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 uh lindor bobblehead is gonna die while you're gone nobody's taking care of it you're unbelievable yeah, exactly I, i'll wait i'm gonna wait till my roommate's back so he can help me <laughs> <laughs> he literally did this setup behind me. So, oh God, I need, I need, uh, need to, help. I need help. Yeah, that's one of the things I need. Well, we will drop an episode likely after that Thursday, and uh, we've gone pretty long here, so we will close this episode of Amazing but True with a story, a figgy fable on a scandal in Colorado. You're gonna want to hear that next. All right, we'll d- debut Figgy's Fables on Amazing But True, and you have pitched in Colorado as an opponent. Yep. And were you there for a potential scandal at Coors Field? Yeah, so in this day and age where scandals seem to be a plenty, you got, you know, I Spy Gate with Aaron Judge, you have the sticky stuff with Scherzer and Domingo Herman. Um, so we were in Colorado and Colorado is set up beautifully. If you look at the backdrop, it looks like you're in nature, right? There's, they've got some rocks set up. They've got a little waterfall thing. And so we're sitting in the bullpen and we're hanging out and we're like, this is kind of cool. Just the way they have it set up the vibe. It's very tranquil. There's tranquility all around you. It's probably what it's like to be a, an outdoorsman here in Colorado. And so our bullpen, uh, coach, uh, is reaching into the ball bag where he pulls out a pair of binoculars. And he's just checking out the sites all around the stadium. And so he's looking around the stadium and he's like, oh, wow. He's like, these things work great. I can see all the way up there. I can see all the way there. And all of a sudden he was sitting and it, the bullpen goes into dead. It used to go into dead center field, like straight across from, you know, you could see straight into the catcher signs and he picks up the binoculars and he's looking straight into the catcher signs. And he's telling us fastball, curveball. He shook off slider. And we're like, oh, man, that's crazy, dude. 
And all of a sudden the umpire whips around and starts pointing at him and running at us in the bullpen. And he just, you know, he's like, what, what, what? And they're telling him to put him away. So he puts him away. He nearly gets fined, suspended. They start writing about it in all the newspapers, how we were stealing signs with binoculars. But they forgot to mention that our team was pitching and he was just watching the catcher setting up because he was also the catching coach. And we're laughing because I'm like, this is like a big deal, like uh, with cheating and everything else. So what did they do? They made fun of him. And the guys in the bullpen, Brad Lidge and guys, um, they made cups with just ripped out the holes in the bottom. And they were wearing cups on their eyes like that for the rest of the game. So it was one of those situations where we're laughing, thinking it's a joking matter. And it became a much bigger deal. And then they had to do an investigation. They realized that, oh, yeah, that's right. Their team was in the field. And maybe he was using the binoculars to to look around the stadium more so than to look at the signs that were being stolen. So Colorado, beautiful place to play for three days. I would never want to pitch there all the time. Um, I had some success there, but at the same time, you're always one pitch away from a disaster. And that's Figgy's fable. And with the Mets starters and their big, you know, you know, struggles there, we would not want to play there. Well, that closes episode 149 of Amazing But Sure, a Mets podcast from the New York Post. Figgy. Ah, uh, thank you, Jake, and to Andrew Hart for producing the show. Give us a like, follow, comment, push buttons, uh, subscribe. I think you memorize these lines by now on season I, four of the program. I'm the one with the bad memory. Now you got a bad memory. What's going uh, on? I, I'm getting older. I'm getting older now. That's true. Your I figured, ARP I figured people knew, card came in. That's right. People knew these things by now. No, that's next year. I can't wait for that. But uh, at Jake Brown Radio, at Figgy NY, at Amazing But True. Um, what else we have? YouTube, all that. No, channel. why are you going to say they know that already? You know, look for our channel on YouTube. Well, uh, someone tweeted, I like this new video YouTube concept. I'm like, we've been doing it like two years. I don't know if it's like, <laughs> if it's new at this point, it was behind, but it's new yes, to them. Watch on YouTube, and maybe you'll see a video there that, of my breaking fighting video oh, outside of Billy's. That. How about that? I saw that. I, I've had two of the biggest videos on the planet and haven't received a penny for either. I need to start selling them at TMZ. I got the Antonio Brown video that probably has 8 billion views. And I have the video of the two hooligan Yankee fans. So people want the background because a lot of people thought it just happened outside the state. It was two hours out after it was outside Billy's. It was after the walk-off win. I don't know if one guy comment. I didn't see inside. I just saw them kind of start to go at it inside security, kicked them out security. I heard the guy say like, just let them go at it. So they were just going at it couple girls got him i don't know if he said something about the girl or what happened that started it guy flashes a badge i think it was a cop that wasn't on you know off duty cop he's flashing a badge like get off me like i'm a cop and uh it was funny because it was a- hours after a walk off it was two fans people were making fun of the kid size yankee jersey like the tj max with yeah, the name yeah, on the yeah. back because the yeah. yankees don't have the name on the back uh-huh. and it blew up and i didn't get a dollar i i gotta start monetizing or do or putting like a watermark of at jake brown radio that's all you it. need to do bro it's all over tmz and everything else it was funny i saw it on bleacher report and then all of a sudden i read your stuff and you're like that's my video <laughs> like it's mine no, you got nothing Ugh. for it, kid. I got I gotta start changing my game plan when I get that. as soon as I took it, I'm like, this is gonna go viral. Um <laughs> and it did. And I was the talk of WFAN the next day. Carton, you know, I, and know. I texted Evan the details. Carton pretends like he doesn't know me when I've covered five of his charity events. I've interviewed him. He said my name because I did a podcast with uh, his f- mutual friend of ours, Constantine Maroulis from mm-hmm. American Idol. So I tweet him. I'm like, bro, I've I've met you five I times. That. I sent him a picture and the video of him saying my name. <laughs> he comes back from the commercial. He says, I got to apologize to Jake Brown. I know Jake Brown. I've met him several times. I apologize. So thank you for the apology. But, you know, I don't know if it's the tequila and sour diesel for Carton that's made him forget <laughs> about me. But it's been years. I'm, you know, I'm not like a monster name. So I get it. But, uh, yeah, getting some love on the fan well we'll be back thursday after this series with the phillies just go sweep the phillies how about that stop how winning one that? game stop winning two let's take out another broom for a you know, second second straight time at home for nelson figueroa andrew hard i'm jake brown we'll talk to you thursday night after the game before i hit the beach and as we always do even though the morale is low the mets are 500 memorial day they're in the race Let's turn it around. We'll close it out in three, two, one. Let's Let's go go Mets. Mets.
God, you're Happy wrong. Memorial Day, folks. I'll see ya.